Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of The Sweet House. I am sitting down today with Megan Alexander. She is an Emmy nominated 15 year career veteran host. You have been this in this <laughs> business for a very, very long time and you're doing an incredible job. She's done work for CVS, Inside Edition, what have you. She's also a best selling author of three different books, Faith in the Spotlight, One More Hug and The Magic of a small town Christmas, which I assume is kind of like an ode to Nashville. What do you think? <laughs> yes, a lot of Nashville and Franklin mixed yeah. in that book. Oh my gosh, I could totally, <laughs> I could totally see it. I was watching this promo of your kids when you announced the book, and they were like, "What's mom doing today?" And you were like, "My book's <laughs> releasing." And I was like, "Yes, I see this for sure." <laughs> That's right. So we're sitting down today to talk about her fabulosity, her faith, and all her philosophies on living the sweet life. So welcome to the sweet house. Thank you, Jasmine. Good to be here with you. <laughs> I know. So it has been years. I think I was like 16 the first time I met you mm -hmm. doing pageants. Yep. Um, I was actually in Cool Springs at a Marriott competing for National American Miss. And now here we are all these years later and my last name has changed. Your last That's name has right. changed. You were Megan Schrader then. That's right. And I was Jasmine Hockett then. Now I'm Jasmine Sweet. See, we're new women new women sitting down to have this conversation. That's right. We were both pageant girls. Yeah. Um, and that experience, gosh, I've met so many neat people yeah. like yourself. And pageant girls go on to do such interesting things. Look we at do. you. Look at you. <laughs> Look, I was Great inspired by you. I'm like, Thank I mean, you. your voice and just like your stage presence, all these things that you learn through pageantry. Like, I have to give you your flowers because everybody who comes to the Sweet House, we give flowers. So oh, I love it. I am just so honored <laughs> to be in your presence. And oh. And you as well, I just my feel dear. like it's like God ordained that mm. like I saw you all those years ago through pageantry and now we're sitting here and able to have those conversations. Yes, you never yeah. know where life is going to take you. Mm -mm. And it's so fun to reconnect with people years yeah. down the road. Mm -hmm. You and I both go to the same church too. We do. Yeah. So we've seen each other in church and yeah. seen our babies and, and our husbands have met. And, yeah. Um, I, you can't make old friends, right? No, so it's neat can't. to have somebody that you have memories with. And Look, it's a you small and I town that. feel. Yeah. It's a small town feel. Feel maybe I should be a part of your second book. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, I yeah, I had a chapter on pageants in my first book. Oh my god! Uh, maybe it's time to do part two. Tell us <laughs> where about people it. are now. <laughs> <laughs> I know where are we now. <laughs> well, we're doing good. I'd say so. Um, she and I were just talking about pageantry and like how it shaped us. So I guess we can kick it off there. Like, what do you think about modern day pageants? And like, I started pageants literally when I was five years old old and continued them all the way until I was 25. So for 20 years of my life, I was in pageantry. You so. did the full thing. You were a lifer. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I was a lifer. My mom made the dresses. She did hair. Like my two sisters, all three of us were walking the stages. Oh, so, I love that. Yeah. And you were born and raised? In Jackson, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. So I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. where pageants were not really a thing. Like yeah, living here in the South now, it's mm -hmm. so common. And I think it's something that a lot of like motivational, you know, ambitious women do. Mm -hmm. But I was 12 and my mm -hmm. mom got a flyer in the mail in Seattle. And I remember she said to me, is this something that you'd want to do? Mm -hmm. And she kind of read the description, you know, mm -hmm. interview, wear an interview outfit, put a pretty <laughs> dress on and walk the stage and learn poise and confidence. And I was an athlete. I played yeah. soccer, played softball, tennis. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing it and going, yeah, that could be fun. Well, you I, had the competitive side. I had the competitive side mm -hmm. and I do enjoy performing. I always did the yeah. school plays and sang in the <laughs> choir. So so I did it in Seattle and got hooked. Yeah. And I remember meeting other girls that were after good things in life. And mm -hmm. it was suddenly cool to get good grades. And I remember just being so inspired by hearing everybody's ambitions yeah. and where they wanted to go to school. It was a light bulb moment for me. Yeah. Um, and something that I'm really grateful for. That's so cool that you started at 12. I guess it's like, I feel like I was almost born into it. Like I was, I'm the youngest of three girls. So I was almost initiated into the world of pageantry. But yeah, I also played sports. And I think that that's a common misconception, first off, with yeah. pageant girls that we're in capable of doing anything yeah. besides walking around in a nice dress. That's right. So 
I think it's it's interesting that you talk about the ambitions that these girls had and like the things that they wanted to do because pageantry does foster and teach all of that. Like yes. you and I both are in careers where we are using public speaking and communication skills mm-hmm. and, and our ambition um, to do our jobs. So, yeah, that's um, right. What do you think about modern day pageants though? I know we talked a little bit about this before we got started with like Miss America system and Miss USA. There's actually a million pageant systems there out are, here now. There's yeah. so many. Is National American Miss still around? National American Miss is still around. Okay. It originally was American co-ed, which was the one mm-hmm. that I was a part of and then branched yeah. off and and became National American Miss. Yeah. I did Miss Washington Teen USA for one year. Mm-hmm. Made top six. Woo woo. <laughs> yeah. uh, but never did it again. But I've stayed involved. You know, I've judged yeah. for the Miss USA pageant. I just recently judged Miss Tennessee USA. Mm-hmm. Judged a Miss Texas USA last year. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my husband's dearest friends growing up is now the director of Miss mm-hmm. Texas USA. His oh, name's wow. Will Henderson. You never know where people are going <laughs> to go on to do. And he has Miss Universe. She went on to win Miss USA and Miss Universe. Oh, wow. Um, so it's been fun to keep keep in touch in that way. But yeah, it's changed a lot. I mean, you and I remember when Miss America and Miss USA were televised yeah. and it was a major event. Mm-hmm. They were on NBC it and was ABC. Super Bowl for us. It was the Super Bowl. And those girls really got that moment in the spotlight, which yeah. led to huge things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, there's a conversation right now of, should we eliminate things like the swimsuit competition in this mm-hmm. world of girl power and women wanting to not just be judged solely on their looks. But then there's also the health fitness argument Mm -hmm. that taking care of yourself and eating healthy is important. And if the swimsuit competition motivates you that way, you know, good for you. Um, Yeah. I I, I think they'll always stay there because Mm -hmm. it is a stepping stone. I mean, girls have literally said, I come from a small town. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to meet people Mm -hmm. and it's a stepping stone to the next part of their career journey. I think it is too, because even when you go back and judge, like as a former pageant girl, it's always eye opening to me. I went back and judged Miss Memphis in the fall and it was just interesting because these girls are a lot of them. This is their introduction to like presenting themselves to the world. Mm -hmm. And so they've, a lot of them had ne- never done pageants before. And to me, it's just, it's an open door. Yes. Um, my sister always says pageants mirror life um, because it's not necessarily about who's the most beautiful or the most talented per se. Yeah. You're in competition. And then the world is also the same way. Like y- it's not necessarily about who's the smartest, who gets the position. Right. So it's not always like the smartest girl that gets the crown. Same way in the real world. You yes. might not get the job opportunity that you thought you deserved or you might have worked very hard to get it yeah um but i think pageants teach you like a level of persistence that otherwise you wouldn't have yeah yeah um did you enjoy the swimsuit competition you know i remember that curtain coming up on mm-hmm. us as we were all on stage in our heels and our swimsuits and i remember going oh my gosh i can't believe <laughs> i'm doing this um you know i I, I remember doing it and just thinking, well, it's one yeah. part of the contest. Mm-hmm. I don't really have too many feelings about it. I think I just yeah. wish I'd hit the gym a little bit more mm-hmm. when the curtain came up. I know. I did same. a one piece too. I, did, I wasn't brave enough to do the bikini. Yeah, I did the bikini. <laughs> you I did. was like, we're out Good here. For you. Yeah. Good but for it's, you. that's always been like, I guess, um, a very controversial one yeah. because, yeah. And then now with body positivity, it's like there's, you know, levels to body positivity and levels to health and wellness and all these things. So it's been a controversial one. So yes. I was just curious to know what your answer would be in today's time. Cause I also feel like it changes. Our yeah. thought process changes from when we were on the stage years ago yes. to like now I'm 33. Yes. Now we both have daughters. Yes, we do. Do you want your daughter to do pageants? You know, I would love for her to try it mm-hmm. and see if it's her thing. Yeah. And if it's not, no worries, yeah. but maybe she'll enjoy it. And yeah. again, maybe she'll be motivated yeah. by the girls that she's around. I mean, I think as parents, we want to put our kids in environments and situations mm-hmm. where they can try new things, you know, gain a little more confidence. So mm-hmm. she is feisty, Jasmine. <laughs> she loves to sing. She yeah. belts out all the Broadway show tunes already. So I could see her possibly really enjoying it. Oh, I it. do too. I think it's like when you start to see these things in your <laughs> kids, you definitely have to foster yeah. them. So yeah. I have to sure. tell you something funny though. The, the, the networking that uh-huh. pageants has given me and I'm sure yep. given you mm-hmm. is really fascinating. 
fascinating. Well, you're proof of it. You're sitting here. You do. <laughs> but I have to tell you a funny story. So um, when I was full time at Inside Edition, which mm-hmm. is a news magazine television show that's mm-hmm. been on for, gosh, 30 years now, um, my boss would always joke that inevitably I would have some connection to the Miss USA or Miss America uh-huh. because it's such a small world. I'd it know is. a runner up or I'd know, you know, mm-hmm. somebody. But um, if you remember a couple of years ago, Sarah Rose Summers mm-hmm. won Miss USA. Yeah. You and I both know her from mm-hmm. the pageant that we were in National American Miss. Mm-hmm. And um, my producer went to cover all the ladies backstage. <laughs> and when it was time to do an interview with her, he said, you know, anything you want to say to anybody out there, you know, this will air on Inside Edition. And she said, I just want to say hi to Megan. Megan, ah. how are you? <laughs> Hope we can do an interview. You know, you know, something like, I love you. And my boss thought she was talking about Meghan Markle, who had just gotten <laughs> engaged to Prince Harry. Oh and so we gosh. put together this whole story, like, and her favorite, you know, celebrity is Meghan Markle. And I went over and tapped my boss on the shoulder. I said, I know that girl. Yeah. I knew her since she was 10. She was talking about me. He's like, are you serious? You know yes. everybody. I said, it's a small world. It is. We all know each other. It is. So. It's almost like we like graduate from pageantry school and then we get placed all around on the map and yeah. then we meet up some kind of way. Yeah. And yes, you are. A celebrity no no not even that I was a celebrity but just it's a small yeah, world and we she knew I, where I was and I knew of her it was funny though yeah but I think like, wow. even you like being the host of these pageants like you calling our names and like you know talking about all of our accolades as we walked across the stage was always so cool to a lot of us like 10 11 12 13 14 years old and we're all just like watching you so yeah of course she wanted to shout out you not Meghan Markle right right like, <laughs> If you're in the pageant world, you would get it. Like those yeah. people yeah. Ha- make an impact on you. The person that held the door for you for mm-hmm. the interview competition yeah. and told you good luck. Yeah. That, this congeniality you'll, matters. Yeah, you'll completely remember those people for yeah. the rest of your life. Everybody yeah. can make an impact in some and way. And the judges matter. I mean, sure. I will say that judging Miss Memphis this past year, the girls actually asked for my feedback. Um, so luckily I'd written it down because I typically don't when I'm judging. I'll like make tiny notes. But this go around for some reason, I was like, let me make it notes in case they ask for this stuff so that's great um, yeah it's just such a good way it's more than like me saying you know rating someone's dress or anything like that it's like what can they do as a total package to be ready to present themselves to this whole big world out here that's waiting on them to get out here speaking of you just got back from the cmt awards and you were walking a star-studded red carpet that's right um that you were made for so (laughs) what was your, what was your most favorite part? Oh gosh. Well, I love country music. Mm-hmm. I've always loved country music. So that yeah. is not work for me. It's just fun. Mm-hmm. And it's such a positive, happy atmosphere. I mean, I've covered yeah. the MTV awards, covered, you know, um, mm-hmm. a lot of different award shows, but mm-hmm. country music, it is like a family. Yeah. Everybody's very chill and happy yeah. and just relaxed. But the big moment of the carpet was Shania Twain. Yeah. I mean, everybody wanted to talk to <laughs> Shania. And when she walked past me, I was interviewing Lainey Wilson, uh-huh. who won two awards at the yeah. CMTs, but it was like, oh my gosh. So I just said to Lainey, I said, there goes Shania. And she turned with me. She's like, oh my gosh, Shania. <laughs> and, and she came over and said hi to us. I mean, it was just everybody oh my gosh. was she so captivated. so personable. Yeah. So personable and really has been such a role model yeah. as a female in this industry. Yeah. And we had the most interesting interview because I said, I've heard you say that you think it's harder mm-hmm. for women yeah. to make headway in country music now than 30 years ago when you entered this industry. And she said, yeah, I actually think it's harder. Mm-hmm. She said, I didn't have the social media pressure. Ooh. I didn't have as much of the, um, she thinks even body image has gotten yeah. more difficult. Mm-hmm. And so she was there um, representing the Equal Play Award, yeah. which is this conversation that mm-hmm. not enough women get their songs played on radio. It's a lot of the guys that dominate. Oh, I can totally see that. Having yeah. worked in an industry that- That's right. Right. Yeah, you know the radio industry. Yeah, yep. I know the radio industry very well. And it's very interesting because I often have these conversations of like women in the workplace, working women and like all of it. And I just I sometimes do wonder if it was easier back then than it is now um, in certain industries. So mm-hmm. that's interesting that she brings that up as a musician. Yeah, I yeah. thought so too. And yeah. So she was really trying to encourage everyone to just hang in there. But at the same yeah. time, we've got to speak yeah. out or 
Yeah, and it's so, I mean, you're competing against everybody. Yeah. Imagine if you moved to Nashville to do music, but then now you're having to compete against everybody on TikTok, and there's a whole other platform now called, um, I think it's Captivate or something, and then the, in case TikTok gets banned, and then you're also competing with YouTube, sure. and like, I mean, I'm starting this YouTube show, and I told you, three people might watch it, yeah. because now I'm in competition with a, with a whole bunch of people, but sure. Barbara Walters and Oprah somehow just made it happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's room for you. Yeah, there but there was a different you. day back yeah. then. Yes. So I can attest to like that also being very much so true. Yeah. I mean, I I worked on the tech side of the business um, in media and I too was one of very few women. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's very common. And I know in the industries that you've been in, you have also seen this too. So I'm sure that was an encouraging word from her. Yes. To you. Yeah. you know, and it's interesting too, because on the one hand, I, I appreciated certain certainly what she said, but I also am very encouraged because Mm -hmm. there are other avenues to get ahead in your success. I mean, Mm -hmm. I tell people when I entered the television world, I mean, you really did have to go through the gatekeepers Mm -hmm. that I say, you know, to get on TV now with your phone and like what Mm -hmm. you're doing, Jasmine, you really have the opportunity to upload Mm -hmm. your content like never before. So in Mm -hmm. some ways I think it's freeing. Yeah. I think you just have to get noticed in all yes. the noise, right? Yes. A lot of noise. Oh, there is so much noise. So, I mean, it's definitely freeing, but I also think that you have to have a level of trust and belief in yourself yeah. that is like beyond compare yes. because they're, those gatekeepers kind of like pulled people along. They pulled people up and over the gate. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you were willing to like go by their rules, now it's kind of like there are no specific rule books yeah. um, and there's no guidebook per se. So I found the producers and like I reached out to you or other people in my network and you know I'm aligning all these things so now it's like well there's not necessarily a blueprint to go off of so you can design it yeah but you that you have to do exactly that you have to figure it out so you went to school for political science but you figured it out and somehow you managed to go into television so how'd that happen well my parents um they were supportive of my desire to go into the entertainment industry, mm-hmm. but my dad very much said, you need to have a sensible major to fall back on. <laughs> and for me, of all the, you know, the different offerings at my college, I went to a small Christian college called Westmont. It's uh-huh. in Santa Barbara, California. There was no broadcast journalism mm-hmm. um, department there. And I w- actually wanted to go to Belmont. Again, mm-hmm. I grew up in Seattle, was very aware of Belmont, but my parents said, that's a little too far. The West Coast has great schools. <laughs> and that's ironic because the minute mm-hmm. I graduated from Westmont, I drove to Nashville. So oh my gosh, I, that is crazy. I eventually got here and my parents now live here part time yeah. when they're not in um, San Diego. So we all got yeah. to Nashville eventually. But I chose political science. And it was really interesting because, you know, how our government operates, Mm -hmm. leadership, the history of, you know, the world and developing countries. I mean, it was a fascinating major, but my Mm -hmm. internship, I always in the back of my mind knew I wanted to do TV Mm -hmm. and got as close as I could. So my junior year, I interned um, for Senator Richard Luger of Indiana, who has since passed away. Mm -hmm. Remarkable leader, wonderful man. And um, I studied at American University. Mm -hmm. And I was in his office and I just thought, you know, I'm fascinated more in the lifestyle aspect of all this. Mm -hmm. Um, Politics is rough. It's divisive. It's feisty. It's gotten even more so, I think, Mm -hmm. um, as you as I know, but uh, you and I know. But I had an opportunity to go to the BBC Mm -hmm. for two days Mm -hmm. as part of my internship. And I watched a reporter put together a story on Princess Diana and Jackie Kennedy, of all things. Yeah. And the way he added the music and, you know, put together the full package. I said, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to be on that side of it. Uh And so I just started doing more internships. I entered at local news whenever I could in Santa Barbara. And then my roommate had transferred from Vanderbilt Mm -hmm. to my small college. Mm -hmm. And so my um, senior year for spring break, I came here and I thought, oh, New York or L.A. with what I wanted to do. But I was like, oh, Nashville. Yeah. This was so interesting. 2003, 2003, you were like way ahead of the times for Nashville. Just to give you guys some context, Nashville was not what it is today. Even in the past three years, let alone 20 years ago, it has transitioned into a major city. Yes. And a major hub for anything you 
you want to do. Yes. So as you can see, we're sitting on Music Row and we're yeah. recording this. So. And my first job, Jasmine, was about two streets over on uh-huh. Division Street. I yeah. worked for a songwriter named Michael Oakes. Incredible guy. We're still friends. And mm-hmm. my job was to go up and down Music Row, knock on doors and try to pitch his songs. Oh, wow. They were CDs back then. Yeah. And the whole process of if you finally got in the door, you'd sit in the room with mm-hmm. an AR representative for yeah. the record label and they'd listen to the song and say they were either going to put it on hold or it was a hard no or they loved it. Yeah. That was fascinating. But this place was quiet. I know. It and now it's bustling. <laughs> yeah. And it's like now. But see, I think that that's what Shania was also getting at. Yeah. So we can go back to that because you talk about taking a CD, which is a concrete object, yeah. like, you know, to each of these places and pitching it. Yeah. And now it's like as influencers or anybody, like when you say pitch now, that means sending 100 emails a day and maybe catching one fish. Yes. And so yes. it's so much more complicated complex and it's way harder to like that that means posting this video yeah. and hoping that like one person or three people watch it or 300 or what yes. have you because it's amongst three million videos but I will tell you this town was great um training ground mm-hmm. I think for going after things that you want and being creative by yeah. it and a quick example is I remember Martina McBride giving an interview mm-hmm. that she had heard that all the record labels in town said you know no mm-hmm. no unsolicited material mm-hmm. so she took her demo reel and she wrote solicited material and <laughs> sent it to like you know back then Sony and Mercury and all of them mm-hmm. and I remember hearing that and going oh that's interesting so I I um, was very creative in how I pitched Michael Oakes's music. I mm-hmm. there's there was a place called Rio Bravo mm-hmm. on West End, mm-hmm. Mexican restaurant, hangout for the industry. Mm-hmm. And one time I was eating um, lunch there, and Liam Rhymes was there, mm-hmm. and I followed her into the bathroom, mm-hmm. and I pitched her the song right at the sink, and she was <laughs> watching her hands. I said, "Hey, I really think you'd be great on track four. <laughs> oh my gosh! Did she say security? <laughs> no, she took it. She was so sweet. She took it and she said thank you so much and put yeah. it in her purse. And, uh-huh. and honestly. I've taken that with me, the folksy, down-to-earth way that people yeah. network in this town in I some agree. ways hasn't changed. Yeah. And I've taken that with me throughout my career, and I really have had a lot of opportunities by just going no. for it mm-hmm. and talking to someone at a party or mm-hmm. approaching them in a non-traditional yeah. way and just trying to be friendly. And um, yeah. So I took that with me, and I think Nashville, especially back then, was really good for that. Yeah, and, I definitely think so. I think it's still good for that. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a big city now, but it still has like the small town network that is willing to go to bat for you I was gonna if say, I push think, comes to shove. I think people here still want to help you. Right? Yes. They still go, oh, mm-hmm. you have a dream? Mm-hmm. How can I connect the dots yeah. for you? And I haven't felt that in any, any other cities as much as yeah. I do in Nashville. And I feel it too because I also think that if you build your portfolio and you're able to showcase that, then people will also believe in you. So yeah. it's like her writing solicited on those yes. albums, like she was <laughs> confirming herself and yes. affirming herself. Yep. And then it, it she giving it to other people it's like, well, they can't deny it if I believe in myself. That's so right. it's That's one right. of those things where you have to go back to your inner foundation and, you know, present yourself to the world that way. Yeah. Because that's what we pageant girls do. That's right. <laughs> and people here are are more open. I don't mm-hmm. think people are as guarded. Yeah. Which I really appreciate. People share their stories more. Yeah. And I, I took that with me to New York City when I was full time at, at mm-hmm. Inside Edition for about seven years. I was really feeling like I wanted to branch off and do some other projects and just mm-hmm. stretch myself as a person. I mm-hmm really wanted to do sports and um, had an interest in, in doing, you know, different spaces. And I bumped into my old boss mm-hmm. in Manhattan, which yeah. is crazy in and of that itself. That you're going to run into someone in New York City. But I was super chatty. And he's like, how are you doing? And I said, oh, well, I'm doing great at Inside Edition. But I also just feel like it's time to pursue other things yeah. and just kind of blabbed. Mm-hmm. And I remember he kind of listened and took it in. He was now, he's way up at CBS. His name's Kurt Davis. Shout out to Kurt, one of the best bosses ever. <laughs> And he said, oh, okay, well, you know, sometimes it's good for a change and mm-hmm. well, I'll be thinking about you and good luck with that. And I went back to my apartment in New York and I told my husband, Brian, oh my gosh, I just made a fool of myself. Mm-hmm. Like I kind of just blabbed to Kurt Davis that, you know, I hope he doesn't think I'm unhappy or ungrateful, yeah. but I just kind of put it out there that I was looking for new opportunities. Mm-hmm. And my husband's like, well, I don't know. It was good. You dangled the carrot because if yeah. you don't, how are they going to know? Yeah. And Jasmine, two weeks later, 
Kurt tracked me down, mm-hmm. emailed me, called me into his office, and he said, hey, CBS just got Thursday Night Football for two seasons. Ooh. You mentioned you're open to new opportunities. And I had told mm-hmm. him that my contract allowed me to also do other things, mm-hmm. which some people would say. Did he know that you wanted to do sports? Yeah. I ah. mentioned to him that I wanted to do sports yeah. and different things in, in the entertainment space. Uh-huh. But um, you know, in our, in our industry, mm-hmm. and you knowing this from radio, sometimes yeah. being vulnerable mm-hmm. and saying that you're not locked into a contract could yeah. also see like maybe you're not as valuable. Mm-hmm. And again, that's going through my head. And I thought, oh, mm-hmm. I just, I, I was just a fool. And he, he brought me in, mm-hmm. I auditioned and I got to cover Thursday night football on CBS for two seasons. Wow. So be vulnerable people, be chatty, mm-hmm. you know, get it yeah. out there, share with well, people yeah, your and dreams. You, you like silenced your imposter syndrome. So I think that that's incredible. And had you never said anything, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have had that opportunity. But how funny that we second guess ourselves. I and I went, oh, Oh, that was so foolish what I Especially just did. Especially when it comes to career <laughs> stuff. But I yeah. think it's interesting to note too that like you just don't know. You so don't you kind of have to have faith in yourself and faith in the process that a yes. door could open. Yes. And that leads me to my next question for you is like, how do these two things coincide? Like you're a woman of faith and like she, like you mentioned, we do go to church together and you're also somebody who works really hard. So you're not sitting around waiting. You're also like, putting these two things together and making them happen. So how do they coincide in your opinion? Yeah. You know, growing up in a Christian home and Mm -hmm. attending Christian school my whole life, um, when I started sharing with people that I wanted to go into the entertainment industry, I really Mm -hmm. didn't get that much support. Mm -hmm. I mean, my parents said that's exciting, but I think they thought I would eventually grow out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, (laughs) good luck with that. (laughs) Um, my parents are not at all in the industry. My dad works in finance. My Uh mom was a stay at home mom and then also Mm -hmm. worked in the art industry in museums. Mm -hmm. And, um, people weren't necessarily supportive, but as I studied the Bible Mm -hmm. more and more, and I'm learning about Moses and Daniel and Esther, these are imperfect people Mm -hmm. who didn't know what to do or say, didn't feel qualified, but God told them go. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you how to do it. Mm -hmm. It'll all, you know, get worked out along the way. Just have the faith and go to dark places and shine your light. Mm -hmm. And so when, you know, people would say to me, why would you want to work in entertainment? That's such a dark you know, mm-hmm. place. One lady even said to me, that's Satan's playground. Oh gosh. I was like, I was like, well, <laughs> but the Bible is full of a very imperfect, messy world yeah. where God uses you and mm-hmm. you don't have to have it all figured out. And so for me, that was just kind of, no, I think I may be called to this industry. Mm-hmm. It, People are people, yeah. right? Nobody's yeah. perfect. And we're, we're all, all peopling. Just, we're all peopling and just figuring <laughs> out our way. And I love telling stories. Yeah. I love learning people's stories. Mm-hmm. I love the creative process, the teamwork, mm-hmm. putting it all together. And so I just kind of kept putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah. But a, a pivotal moment for me was my friend Nathan Shields in mm-hmm. high school. Um, we were all getting ready for prom and taking photos. Mm -hmm. And when the conversation turned to, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. I sort of cringed when I said, I think I want to work in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. And his his dad is a pastor. Mm -hmm. And the Reverend Shield said to me, Megan, every person is a minister. Mm -hmm. Every industry is a ministry. Wow. That's profound. That's it. Yeah. That's it. It is. Anywhere, any place. Absolutely. And I think that also speaks to like finding contentment in whatever season you're in. Yes. So a lot of people are getting laid off. I also was laid off recently. And I just feel like finding contentment no matter where you are, even if you're in a position that you don't necessarily like, or if you're still in pursuit of your dreams, like finding that contentment and belief that it's all happening the way it needs to happen is so important for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Knowing yeah. that there's a grand plan mm-hmm. and that somebody out there is looking out for you. I believe mm-hmm. it's, you know, the Lord up there in heaven. Mm-hmm. Then you can have that peace that, okay, mm-hmm. I really truly believe when God closes a door, yeah. he opens a window. You just never know along the way you know, what's happening. Mm-hmm. And, and you and I both know sometimes rejection can be the biggest blessing. I it know. doesn't it feel really that way can. in the moment, No, but down the road you go, okay, I but wasn't then supposed it, to do that. Absolutely. Because something greater is going to drop on your doorstep any day now. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you just have to be open to that calling over your life for yeah. sure. I do have another question for you. My goal, you say my goal is to leave the audience inspired, empowered, and equipped to achieve their dreams. I also have a special message for the working woman 
on balancing family and professional life. And you and I talked a little bit before we started this about the difference between your dreams and work and just balancing all of it. So how do you balance your dreams, work or paying bills rather with like family life and all of that? How do you balance it? What's the special recipe for it? Uh, I don't think there is one. And I think the word balance, (laughs) we should just throw away because there's no way to possibly balance it. Mm -hmm. Um, Every day is different. Every work, every job requires something different of Mm you. Um, And for me, you know, there was, there was a time in Mm -hmm. my relationship where I was the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. And so when people would say, oh gosh, you know, are you going to stay home with your kids? It wasn't an option at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, So every, you know, every relationship and every family has a different setup and a different situation. Mm -hmm. But I mean, The assumption is what gets me is that you should just stay at home with your kids because you became a mother. It's almost like immediately pushing people out of it. Yeah. And then it's immediately segueing you into a space where you're not able to go for your dreams. You're not able to be a career woman. Now you need to sit down. Yeah. And it's like, I was afraid to become a mother because that's what I thought would happen. And then now that I have been a mother for 16 months, like I'm like, well, I can go after my dreams. Like they might not make all, all the sense in the world world right now. But I just believe that the door has been open for me to go after my dreams and also pursue my career and also be a good mom and a wife. And I try to find some sort of camaraderie, not necessarily balance, but camaraderie amongst all of it. Sure. So, yeah. Well, it's an ongoing conversation too. I mean, for me, Mm -hmm. I I often tell people, I just try to be present in the moment Mm because I I really do enjoy my job. Mm -hmm. Like you, I enjoy Mm -hmm. this industry. I enjoy creating and, and producing and telling stories. And so Mm-hmm. When I'm on the job, I try to just be all in mm-hmm. and, and enjoy it and just lean into the project. And then when I'm home, I try very hard to turn off work, mm-hmm. which is oftentimes, you know, not possible, mm-hmm. especially with our phones and the way that we can be, you know, reached 24 seven. But I try to just be present in the moment and the mm-hmm. season that I'm in. Yeah. Um, but, but Jasmine, when I had my first baby, Chase is now 11, oh my when gosh. he was born, you know, there was still a feeling in television that you couldn't go away for too long. Mm -hmm. And so I've had three C-sections, full disclosure, with all my babies. And so I got eight weeks Mm -hmm. of maternity leave, but you can finagle an extra week Mm -hmm. here and there, you know, or not take, Mm -hmm. you know, money for a while. But I felt like I needed to get back after Mm -hmm. eight weeks that I couldn't be gone for that long. And I'm curious if other women have felt that way. Absolutely. And so that pressure kind of robbed me of some of that joy with my first baby. Yeah. And in this, in my second and third pregnancies with catcher, who's now seven and Capri, who's now three, I tried really hard to Mm -hmm. be present in that Mm -hmm. season with my babies. Cause I didn't feel like I handled it well the first time around. I got nervous that I might even be let go if I was gone too long. Yeah. I mean, you definitely feel like you are walking back into the world of work with a handicap because Mm -hmm. you have now become a mother. And it's like, if you take more time for yourself or you take more time to give to your kid, then you're robbing yourself of the dream to pursue a career. And it's just not a fair perspective to put on ourselves. So finding the contentment for me over the past 16 months has been necessary. Yeah. Like I have done everything in my power to like, like I said, try to find some sort of like level with it. It's it's hard because you do feel like, man, I could get laid off. Man, if I'm not on this meeting at this time, then they feel like I'm not um, doing my job. Man, if I have to go get my daughter and spend the day with her because she's sick, like I'm not good enough. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you're constantly having all of these thoughts and the imposter syndrome is loud and and all of it. And yeah. especially your first time. This is my first time. I just have one. Yeah. And I'm like, man, why is there no blueprint for this? Yeah, exactly. There isn't. And a lot of there women isn't. don't talk about it. Yeah. Like I, I see a lot of women just go and mom. Yeah. Or they are in corporate or they're in um, different roles, but they aren't fully in those roles. And they're silent because they're afraid to disrupt any kind of camaraderie at the workplace. It's yeah. like. Like, yeah, I mean, some of them might be breadwinners, but they're fearful of actually speaking out about what that looks like to be a working mom. So I think we have to have more of these conversations around it. We do. And realizing that everybody's situation is different. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you just said, truly, some women don't get the luxury Mm -hmm. of taking a long maternity leave. My Mm -hmm. college roommate, um, Carolyn, who's now Mm -hmm. a missionary, and she's got many, many beautiful babies with her Mm -hmm. husband. She didn't even get a maternity leave. As a teacher, I Mm -hmm. remember her telling me she was scraping 
keeping together like three or four weeks Mm -hmm. of vacation money and Mm -hmm. different ways that she could pull it off. So being aware of people's situations too, Mm -hmm. everybody's different. Some people might not have the luxury of being gone that long and then, and then just doing what you can to just offer support in small little ways, Mm -hmm. you know, let's get all the kids together. Maybe we can, you know, work a little while the babies play on the floor and trying to support each other in that way. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think having a good community around you has been like top tier for us because we don't have family in Nashville. And so like finding other parents um, who were fresh in this game of parenthood has been like eye opening and refreshing for us because it's like, oh, let's just meet up at the park and just like release today or let's let the kids run around or let's all have dinner and just let the kids entertain each other while we have some adult time. So it's finding those those pockets where you can um, just be the best parent and also yeah. like step away. Yes. So, but it is a, a wild working world for any mother. So for any mother who's taking a break from it, what do you, what would you say to them? Yeah. Well, I would say, you know, good for you. That's the season that you're in right now. And mm-hmm. I wish somebody would have said to me, Hey, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Take this time, be present in this moment. And you also never know Mm -hmm. what's coming around the corner. Yeah. You know, you never, do you feel like with your second or third, you were just more calm about your decisions when it comes to work? Yes, Mm -hmm. I I do think so. I think I knew how quickly it was going to go by Mm -hmm. too. And that I wanted to enjoy it because Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, you're out of the, you know, 12 month size of the onesie or whatever. And I, I I don't know why, but I think it happens so fast. It happens so fast. And I think with my first baby, I thought, Oh, it'll go slower. Mm -hmm. And it just went by so fast. Maybe he just grew really fast, (laughs) but I think just, you know, being present and saying, Hey, Mm -hmm. work is still out there. The projects that you want to do are still out there. Um, being present in this time. But if you do have to work too, I would say, Hey, that you're also showing your babies and your kids what it's like to go after your dreams. Mm -hmm. Um, so if that's where where you need to be in that time, Mm -hmm. you know, family members can jump in Mm -hmm. and support. And my husband was home a lot with the boys and with Capri when they were little, Mm -hmm. he got sweet, sweet bonding moments with them that I'm Mm -hmm. grateful for that a lot of dads don't get. Mm -hmm. So give each other grace. Every situation's different. And, um, I think it just being open to thinking outside of the box and how we handle it. Um, Do you think ageism plays any role in like us feeling like we only have so much time? Like I've thought about that a lot. I am in my early thirties and I didn't want to have kids in my twenties. Like I didn't even think about it until I was 32. I was like, okay, I'm finally ready. Alex and I have been together for 13 years before we decided to be parents. Um, But I've, I've, like I said, always been a career woman by default. And so for me, I just was like, I want to make sure that I have certain things lined up because I want to do this, this and that by 35. I want to do that, that and that by 40, by 45, I need to be doing X, Y, and Z. And I do think ageism has played like a lot of, um, it has played a huge role in my own, I guess, theories as far as work and mom life and like career life. I just wonder, like, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. too? Well, when I got pregnant and I was full time at Inside Edition in New York, mm-hmm. I was 29 mm-hmm. and then had uh, Chase at 30. But I, we announced it on the TV show. And mm-hmm. um, one of the reporters that lives in Los Angeles, an older gentleman, he called me up and his first words to me were, why are you getting pregnant? You're so young. And I was like, uh, my friends down South are on their third baby, honey. (laughs) (laughs) But everybody in Nashville has four or five kids. (laughs) But but, you know, how interesting that everybody has a different concept of early or Mm -hmm. late. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jasmine, I have friends that are having babies in their mid forties now Mm -hmm. who maybe couldn't and wanted to have them earlier. Mm -hmm. Others that just felt they were finally in the place to do it. Yeah. Um, so Yeah, everybody's different. But in terms of the ageism thing, you know, I really feel that my career took off in my 30s. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting when people say that their teens and their 20s are like the best Mm -hmm. season of their life and the most Mm -hmm. fun. I by far feel like I really came into my own in my 30s. Mm -hmm. I mean, the big kind of goals I had for myself happened way later Mm -hmm. in my 30s. So I I just want to tell women I'm excited for you because you don't know what's around the corner. Mm -hmm. Um, That has been my experience. And I I, I feel bad for anyone that feels, you know, when they're about to turn 30, that for some reason, Mm -hmm. all of that is slipping away because it just began for me when I turned 30. Had my kids, started really achieving, you know, some of my personal projects. Mm -hmm. So 
Hey, I maybe agree. the 40s and the 50s will be even Look, better, right? Look, I mean, Oprah and everyone else yeah. has turned a 50. Tina Knowles, Beyonce's yeah. mom. I'm like, literally everyone has said it's like the golden years, the older you get. So, Isn't it a mindset, yeah. too, in how we approach it? Yeah. It and, is, I think. But there's social constructs around it, too. I feel like in, in the working world, for one, women have only been in the working world for a few decades. And so, and to carry high-level positions in the working world, it's almost been a non-existent thing a lot of us are still the only woman in certain industries um so or the minority in a lot of different industries so it's not common for us to exist in these spaces as moms and wives and we have other roles besides what our title is at work and so I think it's just you know the ageism for me I probably put a lot of it on myself, but also I've not seen other women who are 40 something and 50 something in positions that I would necessarily like aspire for myself. Like my mom was also a housewife. Um, I had an aunt that worked in corporate. She got laid off in her late forties. Um, and that's not retirement age yet, but she's like, if she tries to go, when, whenever she did try to go back into corporate, it was very hard for her to attain a position at that high of a level. And so I just wonder sometimes if like ageism is just going to continue to show its ugly head. And that's why I brought it up. I'm just yeah. like, I feel like we think we have this short window yeah. of like between 20 and 35, you got to make it or else yeah. it's over for you. Yeah. And so and in some industries it is. Um, but I do think that like the world is opening up more to women and moms all being able to have a space, have a place in those yeah. spaces. So. You, you know, and I, it's so much your attitude too, mm -hmm. and how you approach it. I mean, I really have friends of all different ages. Yeah. I mean, I just went to an event last night in Nashville. Brian and I brought mm -hmm. a friend of ours who's 27. Mm -hmm. She moved here from California. She's a pageant girl, mm -hmm. Nicole Renard. Okay. You might know her. <laughs> um, but we, we, we had so much fun, the three of us hanging mm -hmm. out. Cause again, we're just old friends, but then I, I have friends, forties, fifties, sixties. My sweet neighbor, Sherry is mm -hmm. 80. Yeah. And I love talking to her about dreams and projects and what's going on in her life. So mm -hmm. I really think it's attitude. Attitude. Yeah. You can have that young energy yeah. at all different ages, mm -hmm. right? And you know how you're around some people that are similar to your age, but they just seem older? Yeah. So I think it really yeah. is your attitude and I your think, mindset. Yeah. And that's a great way of putting it. And I also think that we have to continue to show up in these spaces so that yes. people can see that it's possible. Yeah. So, I mean, I've talked to several women who have gotten laid off in from their jobs and then they decided that they were just going to mom. And while that's okay, I also want people people to know that they can come back into the working world and yes. do whatever it is they want to do. Um, you cover a lot of different stories in the world. Um, last week in Nashville, we definitely had a hard one with um, what happened at Covenant. And I just wonder, how do you go home and like talk to your kids about these things? Because you are on the forefront of a lot of these stories and then you go home and have conversations with your own family. So yeah. how do you decompress, but also have genuine conversations with them so yeah. they know how to handle it? Yeah. Well, it is life. I mean, mm -hmm. I, in this industry, I have covered all different types of events, mm -hmm. you know, tornadoes, mm -hmm. natural disasters, hurricanes shootings. Mm -hmm. Um, that is life. Life is messy. There is good and evil in this world. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just try to approach it as, okay, we're, we're supposed to tell the story here. And I just try very hard to be respectful. Jasmine, in those moments, mm -hmm. I have said countless, countless quick little prayers, Lord, help me just help me to handle this situation in the mm -hmm. way you want me to. Some people like to talk. That mm -hmm. is part of grieving. Mm -hmm. Some people want to tell the story of a loved one or somebody that has passed away or their town that mm -hmm. has been affected by a tornado or a hurricane. Some people they want to talk, they want to grieve, others don't. Mm -hmm. And so I just try very hard to read the person mm -hmm. and, and understand um, how they're feeling. And then I just come home and talk to my kids and mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, I tell them again, there's good and evil in this world. Mm -hmm. But I, I often say to them, there's so many good people in this world. There I are. think there's so few bad yeah. people the bad people tend to get the attention mm -hmm. because the media tends to rush to that one well, narrative. Well, that's where the ratings are. <laughs> and it's the shock factor too, right? Mm -hmm. The shock and awe. But then I try to say, but look at all the good people showing mm -hmm. up and helping. Yeah. Look at how people are helping. And, you know, we've all heard Mr. Rogers say in yeah. a tragedy, look for the helpers. Yeah. Who's helping? And 
I will say too, Jasmine, there have been times when, you know, people have often said to me, Oh, why did you choose to tell that story? And I've said, I didn't choose. I got assigned that story. Yeah. And as a reporter, you, you often can't say no. Mm-hmm. You're just told that's what you're doing today. You mm-hmm. can pitch all the stories you want. I can constantly be pitching good mm-hmm. news and inspirational stories, but sometimes you're just assigned to the news of the day. Mm-hmm. But there have been countless times where I've complained to my husband, oh my gosh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to cover mm-hmm. it. And he has said, what about if this is exactly where you're supposed to be today? Mm-hmm. And so I just try to trust that maybe yeah. there's some person I'm supposed to meet, mm-hmm. some story I'm supposed to tell. And I, I, I will tell you with the Nashville shooting, you and I both live here in Nashville. We mm-hmm. both have small kids. When that occurred, I felt the same way. I thought, oh my gosh, I just, I want to just go mourn with the families and mm-hmm. hug my babies. But I prayed that prayer. I said, Lord, I'm supposed to go to work today. And New York did call me. I mean, I'm a freelancer now for Inside Edition. I only work when they want me to mm-hmm. or when I'm available. But they asked me to work. Mm-hmm. And my assignment, Jasmine, was to go interview Sissy Goff, mm-hmm. who is a world-renowned child psychologist. Mm-hmm. And so that day I got to listen to an expert mm-hmm. help parents process, mm-hmm. grieve, what, what should we say to our kids? Mm-hmm. What should we not say to our kids? It was a tremendous blessing. Mm-hmm. And I videotaped our interview and posted it on my social media. Um, look up Sissy Goff, everybody, if you have a chance, Daystar Ministries. Yeah. But I'm glad I went to work that day. And I, I felt in too. some small way I was helping. Yeah. Well, you were the catalyst. Process. Yeah. Because you put together the package. You were the catalyst to share the light with the world during such a tragic time. Yeah. So, yeah. And I'm sure even with some of your interview subjects, you're learning things from them so that you can go convey the message to your family. Yeah. So I know it's not an easy conversation for sure. I mean, it's not an easy conversation for a lot of parents. Right. So, it's life. Yeah. What do we do? What it's do we life. Say? It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say about Nashville is Nashville is a city that definitely comes to the rescue um, in all these situations with the tornado. Like we had a surplus of volunteers with this situation. We've had a a surplus of people coming together for all different things. Like Alex and I were driving through Cheekwood um, area the other day and all of the homes had ribbons outside of them commemorating those lives. So I just think it's such a great place to live because we all come together yes and it's just beautiful it's yeah. a harmonious community so. i completely agree a lot of big mm-hmm. hearts here mm-hmm. people really open up in mm-hmm. a time of need i was just at an event last night that my friends eric and jesse james decker hosted mm-hmm. um to give money it was originally the event was originally to support mm-hmm. mental health for nfl players coming mm-hmm. out of the nfl and just counseling that they might need and they pivoted mm-hmm. and said that they were going to give a portion of the proceeds to the covenant school oh wow and everybody donated last night mm-hmm. and just opened up their wallets and so Nashville's a very generous city you're right we rally around the cause yeah and and people show up for their loved ones yeah we show up in Nashville that's right we sure do if you want to come to Nashville just know (laughs) you've got a lot of family members everybody's got kids yeah (laughs) look as you mentioned all my girlfriends down south have kids it's true (laughs) lots of them running around lots of them (laughs) so you've interviewed presidents CEOs actors and so many different people are there any interviews that have been like they've just stuck with you and helped you continue to maintain your career in television yeah oh that's a good one well I'm always very impressed by people that are the same on and off camera Mm -hmm. Um, I tend to get the best of people because the Mm -hmm. camera's on and I know they want to give a good impression so a lot of people say do you have a crazy celeb story or someone that wasn't Mm -hmm. very nice and I'm like I really don't because a lot of them are on their best behavior (laughs) when I'm interviewing them but I you know, I'm, I'm just inspired by people like Hugh Jackman yeah. who came into the inside edition studios when he was um, promoting the movie Australia uh-huh. and asked every person in the room, their name, oh, wow. met all the crew, Yeah, you know, was just so down to earth and personable, uh-huh. um, very patient person. Yeah. You know, some people get annoyed if it takes a long time to set up equipment mm-hmm. and he just seemed like he had all the time in the world. And I'm like, this is Hugh Jackman. I know. I'm sure he has a lot on his plate, yeah. but I'm always inspired by those people. And then the, the, the second story that I love telling my boys mm-hmm. is Drew Brees. Mm. Um, he was a quarterback for the um, New Orleans Saints. Mm-hmm. I watched that interview on your YouTube. Do you remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> I was 
listening to some of it yesterday, actually. Yeah. So I, the yeah. boys are big into sports now. Uh-huh. My boys are like, oh, have you met Tom Brady? Yeah. You know, and they're always asking me <laughs> questions. But I share with them. I interviewed Drew Brees for, I think it was Super Bowl 51. I had mm-hmm. to get up at 4 a.m. because yeah. he was doing early morning interviews. Um, and, you know, all the morning shows on the East Coast are go- coming on at 6 a.m. So we mm-hmm. had to get up at 4. But... Um, he was the spokesperson for the Microsoft Surface, mm-hmm. which is like their version of the iPad. Yeah. The NFL was transferring, you know, the old school binders mm-hmm. for all the plays to electronics. Mm-hmm. And so now he was promoting the Microsoft Surface for all the plays. And he said, mm-hmm. oh, it's this, that, and the other. It's waterproof. Mm-hmm. And I thought, what can I do to catch my boss's eye with this interview? I think Drew Brees is amazing. I know he's a mm-hmm. good family man and strong Christian. But inside edition, you got to have something to catch my boss's mm-hmm. eye. And so when he said it's waterproof... I said, Drew, would you be okay if um, you dunked me over the head with a gigantic tub of oh water, of ice water? The things and, you're willing to do. And, he, and I knew in my head that was how to get us on TV. And uh-huh. he looked at me and he's like, are you sure you're okay with that? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> so it was a one take wonder. Mm-hmm. You can Google it on uh, YouTube, but he dumped me over the head with this gigantic, you know, oh the, you know, gosh. those big Gatorade things that they yeah. dump on the coaches as they're uh-huh. about to win the game. He t- completely doused me. And then we laughed about it. But then when they cut the camera, mm-hmm. there was ice all over the floor. It was super wet. Mm-hmm. He got down on his hands and knees with me with towels mm-hmm. and started cleaning up the floor. Yeah. He the humility of towel. it. He stayed with my crew. He's like, Oh, we need another towel over here. And I told my boy, Boys, that's a gentleman right there. Yeah. That's, that's true sportsmanship. That's yeah. professionalism. He didn't leave until the whole place was cleaned up. Mm-hmm. This is a Super Bowl winning quarterback who could have said peace out and left with his entourage. Yeah. And he didn't. Yeah. And so those are the stories I like to tell my kids. That's servant leadership. Well, I definitely love both of those stories because it seems like they they were outside of just the interview. This is actually like knowing somebody and watching their mannerisms whenever you're working with them. So that's really cool. Real but stuff. I also feel like you exude such like joy and just you're easy to work with. So I feel like people would naturally like gravitate to that about you. So that's nice yeah. of you to say. I try to be the same yeah. person on and off the camera too. I mean, yeah. those people have inspired me to be that way. The camera scares people. I feel like sometimes when people get in front of the camera like I've interviewed people and I feel like I have to pull it out of them because the camera scares people and with editing nowadays you can make somebody say something they didn't say yeah that's true that's true so you know if you can get the best of people then I think that's great that you don't have any negative stories to tell about anybody you or I just won't share or yeah she's not gonna share with us (laughs) no we're only putting the light out into the world um so I wanted to ask you how can one get some media coverage because even you in that example were like, let me pour some water with ice over my head. Yes. Like, how does the average person get media coverage? And is it necessary in the world of social media? Yeah, well, I do think I do think doing something to grab people's attention is mm-hmm. helpful. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was just a moment. You mm-hmm. know, I think being creative goes a long way. You know that. Mm-hmm. Also answering a question. Yeah. Why do people care? Mm-hmm. Why should they care about what you're talking about? How will it help them or mm-hmm. benefit their life in mm-hmm. some way? I think answering some of those basic needs questions is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I tell people, you know, be creative. Mm-hmm. Also keep it simple. Yeah. I don't think we need to get super complicated. Yeah. Um, when I've, you know, advised brands or, or companies or even just people that come to me with a book mm-hmm. or a movie mm-hmm. and say, hey, how could I, you know, get this, get this on television or whatnot? I think being creative um, mm-hmm. and keeping it simple is really important. And then, I mean, honestly, the little secret I would share with people is make it really easy on the media. Mm-hmm. Right? three questions that yeah. you would like us to ask you in the email. Okay. Give us a very short paragraph about why we should care about this product mm-hmm. or service. Give us photos. Yeah. Um, just serve a it up. A media kit is something to go yeah, off of. Just yeah. serve it up as easy as possible because yeah. in my experience, my, my producers are, they're just slammed during the day. Mm-hmm. They're doing multiple stories. They're not just doing your one. Mm-hmm. So the easiest you can make it on them mm-hmm. really helps. And yeah. that's something that I try to do whenever I have a book mm-hmm. coming out. I'm like, how can I make this so easy on you mm-hmm. so you can just slip it on air? Yeah. Um, I've never important. thought about it in that way that somebody should present their own questions that they want to be asked. They I mean, may not use sense. them, but they might. Yeah. I mean, but they you have know. the answers. So yeah. why not? Like, go ahead and give it to somebody. So. And I think 
submitting questions help them helps them visualize how mm-hmm. the interview will take shape, yeah. how the story could take shape. Again, mm-hmm. it's not so much that they'll use it, but they'll go, oh, I'm seeing how this could come together. Mm-hmm. I think just that toolkit is very, yeah. very helpful. But in terms of social media versus television media, what are your thoughts on like the different ways to go about marketing yourself? I think being creative is also really important. Catching mm-hmm. people's eyes, mm-hmm. you know, cutting through the noise. Mm-hmm. You're really good at that with your post, Jasmine. <laughs> Asking questions. Yeah. You'll post a photo and then ask yeah. a question mm-hmm. and getting yeah. people to engage. Yeah. And, you know, how can you engage the viewer, the, you yeah. know, your, your fans Well, and I followers. think there's so much noise, like we mentioned early on, on social media. So for me, like, I like to create packages, whether it's just an image or at this point, we have to do it all. Like, you have to be a videographer, a photographer, an editor. You have to present the world with, like, so much. So to me, in order to quiet the rest of the noise, sometimes I'll just post a carousel of, like, still images that showcase different things. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I draft people in. And then I also will write a caption that's like captivating that engages them and paints the picture for them. So yes, I think it's just picture. Yes, paints the picture for sure. I have not found in my own career that I necessarily need television media coverage per se. Um, I think it just depends on what you're trying to do. If you have a clothing line and you're trying to sell it, maybe try to go on the local news or, you know, if Mm -hmm. you Mm-hmm. have music or what have you I think maybe social media Spotify and yes. all these different means are ways so it's just like the digital world has opened up so much for us to be present and share our talents with the world yes and collaborations sure. finding mm-hmm. people that are in your same yeah. space or there's some unique way that you can yeah. cross over and help mm-hmm. each other that's just fun stuff too, yeah it is right the collaborations that we can do on social media yeah and I love like when you will post with your family yeah I want to know what you're up to yeah parenting style yeah you you and your hubby I mean it's so funny to me. I posted this um, video of my husband shooting mm. baseballs off the front porch with yeah. our pitching machine mm-hmm. and my boys are catching fly balls in the yard and it's getting so many views. Oh and I thought God. I have so many pretty <laughs> pictures of all these other events and stuff, but people just like regular life sometimes. But also social media can be like, <laughs> you know, it picks and chooses what it wants to share. It's like it's you true. can have a beautifully shot studio photo that gets like no attraction. And then you go post something just like as basic as throwing balls in the front yard. Yeah. And then it has a million views. So you just never know what you're going to get. So to me, that's a a sign to stay consistent with your content and constantly like putting things out there um, that represent who you are as a person or a brand. So I definitely think it makes sense. While we're talking about influencers um, in the world of influencers, what does that mean to you to be an influencer? Yeah, you know, I think it's taking your platform seriously Mm -hmm. and knowing that you've been put in a position where you have an opportunity to inspire and Mm -hmm. encourage. I think, you know, I I tell my kids it's a responsibility Mm -hmm. like anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, influencers in many ways is just the newest model of a platform that people had if they, you know, whether it was television, radio, Mm -hmm. sports star, um, influence in your neighborhood, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. if you run your HOA or, I mean, I just think it's, it's being responsible for where yeah. God has placed you. I think everything happens for a reason. Yeah. So if you have a platform as an influencer, mm-hmm. what are you going to do with it mm-hmm. at the end of the day? I mean, this is the way my mind works. I think, well, mm-hmm. we're all going to the same place one day and when yeah. we're in heaven yeah. and God says, what did you do with the blessings that I gave you? Yeah. Are you going to be proud of all that you share. Mm-hmm. I and mean, that's kind of what I try to run past myself. And yeah. listen, I have the silly photos too, where he's probably going <laughs> to scratch his head and be like, what was that? I know, but, right? you know, just yeah. keeping that conversation going in your yeah. mind. What Am I going to better people's lives with this? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's um, so interesting. Have your kids started talking about what they want to do with their lives yet? Yes. Yeah. And so I was mentoring at a middle school and I asked the kids like what they wanted to do. And a lot of them were like, we want to be a YouTube star and or I want to be a YouTube YouTube star or an influencer. And so I was explaining to them my role as a marketing professional and they were like, so you're like a YouTube star, right? (laughs) And I'm like, well, not quite. Um, It's a little different, but in conveying what I did for a living, I also wanted to cover like what an influencer is. And I think you bring up a good topic, whether you're running the HOA in your neighborhood, you are an influencer of how the grass gets cut. You're an influencer of who gets to have a, a fence in their 
their yard, all these things. It's like, what are you an influencer of? Are you a barista? Are you a coffee connoisseur? Like, what are you an influencer of? Are you an expert at videography? So I think it's just an interesting, an interesting concept and construct because influencers are um, known for just taking pictures or just selling things. But I think that everybody has the opportunity to be an influencer. So that's what I was just wondering what your perspective was on becoming an influencer in today's time and what your kids are thinking. Yeah. You know, I I find myself longing for the Mm -hmm. deep one-on-one conversations more than ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm, I look forward to when my sons have baseball games and getting mm-hmm. to talk to the parents in the stands and mm-hmm. just have, you know, that those relationships. I mean, I, I, I hope that I'm instilling in my kids that mm-hmm. nothing takes the place of one-on-one personal yeah. contact and mm-hmm. listening to people, looking yeah. them in the eye. I mean, I, my kids do not have phones. Mm-hmm. Um, even my 11 year old, do they have social media? No, 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 no mm-hmm. social media. My 11 year old is aware of what it is. Like mm-hmm. I will show him maybe something on Instagram and just try to explain it in really broad, you know, basic terms mm-hmm. because it is a part of the world. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there will be a fun funny video. Like there was this video the other day of these three girls dancing and then they all shot three pointers on the basketball court and made mm-hmm. it. And I was like, come here, Chase. This oh is really gosh, cool. Yeah. Oh, I want you to see this. So he's aware in broad terms of it, mm-hmm. but I'm trying to hold off as long as I can because yeah. you and I both know it's so distracting and yeah. I want them to have that child. Yeah. And if had. they don't have the fundamentals no. to process it all, then right. it's not necessary for kids to right be presented with these things. So, I mean, there's tons of conversations happening on social media that maybe they shouldn't be privy to. Yes. Yeah. Imagery. Maybe they shouldn't be privy to not yet. So I agree in protecting them. Rain has an Instagram channel that's run by mom and dad and it is private. Okay. (laughs) So it's really just to share photos with family and friends. So I'm like, when people do find it, they're like, she has an Instagram though. I'm like, it's private. Yeah. She has 200 followers. Have you grabbed all of her social media handles? Um, I only got, yes, I did okay. mm-hmm. just for her. Yeah. That is something yeah. my husband and I talked about. We're yeah. like, even though we want to push it off as long as we can, yeah. what about like my son's middle name is Devin. His mm-hmm. name is Chase Devin. Mm-hmm. And I think that sounds like a yeah. country singer. Yes. So like, should I go grab that Instagram I handle? Would, yeah. And, Cause maybe when he's 22, yeah. he'll be like, thanks mom and dad for grabbing it. Oh, absolutely. Because <laughs> I think it's a great business world decision. Live in. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's, it's and at some point. I think we have to come to terms with this. Nobody is grab that Instagram in. handle. Nobody grab it. I'm going to so, go get yeah. it right now. I did grab hers. It's <laughs> rain opal sweet. Now okay. somebody already had Jasmine sweet. So I had to change my Instagram name. I always use my first and middle name, Jasmine Katrina. And I recently changed it on Instagram to Jasmine K Sweet um, because somebody has Jasmine Sweet and they're not even using it. It's like a bot. And I'm like, I reported it to Instagram. Can't get it back. I don't know what's happening. Same thing happened with me and Megan Alexander on Instagram. It's some girl that posted last in like 2014 in Denver. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. Why? <laughs> so yes, snatch your Instagram name, snatch your business names, That's whatever. Right. And just for yes. a business too. Yeah. Right? Maybe they'll want to yeah. use it someday as an entrepreneur. So. Yeah. And who knows? It's they might world. be early entrepreneurs. That's right. They could be like 15 and ready to use their name. So. Yeah. And that's the yeah. whole thing is how we approach it. Mm-hmm. There are there are ways that social media has been very helpful Mm -hmm. to network, to connect, to sell from a business point of view. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. I, again, it's just putting it in the proper place. Yeah, I definitely think so. I have another question about the harshest criticism that you've received, um, as a television host, because I know you, like all of us on social media, get all kinds of crazy stuff. I had someone message me once that said her seatbelt isn't on right (laughs) when it comes to rain in her car seat. And I'm like, honey, she's sitting in the house. It's fine. (laughs) And so it's like, we're all getting these messages from audience audiences that are watching us. So what's the harshest criticism you've received maybe from an audience or from people you work with? Yeah. I mean, I remember. And how'd you deal with it? Yeah. I remember in local news, one of viewer would email me constantly and tell me my hair looked fried and dry. (laughs) She was like, you need to get advice on your hair. It just looks so fried. And I had blonder hair and highlights. Uh I remember yeah. thinking, oh, you know, the physical stuff, honestly, Jasmine, I'm not perfect, but I do think you come to a point in life where you're like, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. This is who God has made me. Yeah. I'm going to just, you know, 
accentuate my best qualities and yeah. realize that, you know, it's, nothing's going to be perfect. Mm-mm. But probably the one that gets me in the gut the most is when people say, I can't believe you covered that or I uh-huh. can't believe you did that. Yeah. And I was assigned it. Yeah. I didn't have a choice. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, that's probably the hardest part. And I think there there's become an awareness now mm-hmm. of, you know, that it is a business, mm-hmm. you know, even you, maybe something mm-hmm. that you post or whatever, there's a mm-hmm. contract going on. There's a transaction there. And so at certain points in your career, you can make that call, yes. but at certain points in your career, you cannot, you don't have the authority to do so. It was early on for me, mm-hmm. early on in the news media. I really thought if I said, no, I'd get fired. Mm-hmm. And this was how I was paying the bills. This is, you know, how I was supporting my family. And so you're right. And I think there are times when you have to say, what's it worth? Mm-hmm. Maybe you are supposed to walk away. And mm-hmm. I've never done anything that I really felt like I compromised hugely on. Mm-hmm. I think it's just some of the stories where people say, I can't believe you did that. And I'm like, but what about the lawyers that represent clients that mm-hmm. they're not crazy about? I'm grateful that we live in a country mm-hmm. where everybody gets representation. Mm-hmm. Um, what about the police officers and firefighters that have to show up to a awful scene mm-hmm. and wish they'd never seen what they saw, mm-hmm. but they still answered the call. Yeah. They are way better than what I'm doing. I mean, yeah. I'm just down here in the media world, but I think yeah. again, it's giving each other grace, yeah. realizing we never know the situation and what people are going through. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, that's probably the most painful is when you just don't know the yeah. backstory on stuff. Yeah. And I think, you know, as somebody who's in media, like you're, you are just to me as important as firefighters or police officers or any of that, because you are yeah. bringing awareness. I don't it. know, girl. I don't I, know. My I husband was so. a firefighter and he runs into those burning buildings. And well, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, obviously it's like a <laughs> dire job, but I also feel like it's not easy for you to get up here and tell the world or even collect like the information that you need to tell the world. I mean, I did it for like an internship and we were knocking on people's doors and I'm like, yeah. Oh my goodness. I don't know what's on the other side of this situation. And then you have to pull it together to go tell the world about it. So it's not easy. It's not like you by choice were excited or enthused to tell these stories per se. These were the stories that were put on your doorstep and this is what you have to put together to tell the public. Sure. So yeah. And it's also been a stepping stone for me now later in my career to produce family friendly Mm -hmm. content, which is Mm -hmm. really where my passion is, Mm -hmm. whether it's books that I'm writing or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, specials and things that families can watch together. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have, you're going to come into this quickly with uh, your little one, but you know, it's hard to find movies and TV shows to watch as a family. It is. It's and very so much I want to so be hard. part of producing that content. You know, yeah. this Christmas show that I've produced the last two seasons of mm-hmm. small town Christmas on up TV. I can watch it with all my kids. And I tell families no problem whatsoever. This mm-hmm. is completely G. Yeah. There's not a lot of options out there, yeah. but putting in the hard work in yeah. the past, maybe covering things that I wasn't crazy about gave me some of the technical skills now that I can apply to these projects. So you have a production company. Tell us about it. You mentioned yeah. just a little bit about like your goal for it, but like what, are, what other projects are you working on or in the pipeline that you can tell us about? Yes. So I've really, my desire is really to transfer all those skills that mm-hmm. I've learned again, to produce family friendly content. Mm-hmm. I'm a mother of three kids. That's yeah. my season of life right now. Yeah. That's where I want to be. Mm-hmm. And so we produced this Christmas travel show called mm-hmm. small town Christmas on mm-hmm. up TV, up mm-hmm. faith and family, which is a wonderful network. Mm-hmm. And we're working on a couple movies. Yeah. Um, I've got a, a, a partner in, in the business. We've put together two different scripts. Mm-hmm. One's more of a harder story with a redemptive arc. It's definitely Mm -hmm. more of a drama, but Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's got a lot of hope and Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a positive outcome dealing with some real life problems, some drug issues that a mother and son are going through Mm -hmm. that I'm excited about because again, you know, good entertainment can really touch our soul and Mm -hmm. inspire us, but let's Mm -hmm. also be real about it. Mm -hmm. And then we're working on a Christmas movie. Yeah. So hoping to get the green light on those soon. Yeah. Well, I am super proud of you because I can definitely tell that you have taken and everything that you've learned from every part of your career and even you as a mother and a wife and you've applied it to what you're doing. It's obvious and it shows through your passion for television and creating content that's like available for everybody and for everybody to see. You're so so kind, Jasmine. I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of what you're doing here. It's all about telling stories and encourage each other. And honestly, this is fun. Yeah, right. It is fun. It's fun. If it's continuing to be fun, 
then we're in the right space. Mm-hmm. And I still have fun. I get excited yeah. waking up in the morning, yeah. knowing I'm working in this industry in sm- yeah. some small way. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, we're blessed yeah. that we get to do that. We are blessed that we get to do it. It definitely took a while to like get to this place where I, like, li- literally I just got laid off and I called Aaron and I'm like, we're doing this. And yeah, it is alleviating to actually do it. And also like, this is a faith walk for me because I have no idea of like what's on the other side of this. So yeah. thank you for sitting down with me you today. Can. Thank you for having and me. I love your studio. Uh, thank you. This is the sweet house, but She's it's on not Music really Row, everybody. She <laughs> has made it. Music Row is still the standard in yes. this town. Well, you guys make sure that you stay in touch with Megan Alexander because she is going to be putting out so much good family content for all of you guys to indulge in. I've got a 16 month old and she and I will be watching along with my husband and we can't wait to see what you do next. So thank thank you you for coming to the sweet house. Thank you. See you in church. Yes. See you on Sunday. (laughs) 